The thing about World War II is that it was a world war. With so many countries involved in the global conflict, every child around the globe learns about it in a different way, unique to the role their country played in the conflict. The United States views America as the hero. Russia's education system may see things a bit differently. Countries like Germany, Italy, and Japan have some harsh realities to face. And Antarctica is, well, largely unaffected. Based on responses written by Redditors from various countries, you can begin to see that the Second Great War looks slightly different depending on who is remembering it. So, today, let's explore how World War II was taught around the world. But before we fight on the beaches, on the landing grounds, in the fields, and in the streets, why don't you make your way over to the subscribe button? Then storm the comments section and let us know what other global conflicts you want to hear about. Now, time for some history to end all histories. When the whole Second World War started with your country, you might assume it's a sensitive topic to bring up. But rather than shy away from history, children in Germany embrace it, visiting many sites that revolve around the Holocaust and Reichstag. In particular, many students visit concentration camp Sachsenhausen, which has now been turned into a museum that offers guided tours. In this way, school-aged kids are not just taught about history, but what has evolved since then. These lessons were not whitewashed, especially when it comes to the Third Reich its origins, and its consequences. Movies and lectures are utilized to drive the points home, with Schindler's List being a popular example. The operational history of World War II is only lightly touched upon, with more focus going toward the rise of fascism, Nazi atrocities, Allied plans for post-war Germany, and the constitutional defects that led to Adolf Hitler's rise. With these lessons, hopefully the youth can avoid history repeating itself. Japan and South Korea just can't seem to agree on how history should be taught. The education ministries of each country are entwined in a years-long bitter battle regarding textbook descriptions of World War II. At the crux of this headbutting is the ownership of Leoncourt Rocks, a group of islets in the Sea of Japan. South Korea is of the opinion that Japan ceded these islets and other offshore possessions after World War II, while Japan is of the opinion that South Korea doesn't know what they're talking about. But the other more sinister issue was that of Korean comfort women, who were forced into servitude for Japanese soldiers. In fact, only one history textbook approved by Japan's Ministry of Education, Culture, and Technology even mentions comfort women. Despite doing their best to pretend this sore subject never happened, Japan started offering reparations to surviving comfort women. Yet this dark part of history is still a point of contention between the two nations. France's participation in World War II cannot be overlooked, not by the people of France, anyway. When France established the collaborationist Vichy government to appease the occupying Nazis, they adopted many anti-Semitic laws and viewpoints along with it. And today, the French education system is pretty much based on feeling really, really bad about how things went down. In fact, the Vichy debacle is considered as heinous as the Holocaust in France, often giving both traumas equal space in museums. So much focus is put on this dishonor that non-European parts of the war are rarely mentioned. Sacre bleu indeed. While the Netherlands retains painful memories of deported Jewish people to Eastern Europe, the focus of their education is geared more toward the heroes of the war, rather than the unfortunate victims. For the Dutch, it's all about the resistance members and their tales of courage. Resistance members are the stars of several children's and young adult books, and those involved are lauded as heroes throughout history. These stories illustrate resistance members hiding Jewish friends, assisting allied pilots, and committing a little low-key arson to burn the registration of any Jewish folks living in the area providing a much-needed edge against the Germans. Students are aware that World War II emboldened the National Socialist Movement in the Netherlands, or NSB, but to admit that a family member was a part of them is about as bad as admitting you don't like Stroopwafels, which we assume is a crime in the Netherlands. Italy played a co-starring role in World War II, joining the axis of power against their hated enemy, the Allies. In modern classrooms, Italy's lower secondary schools focus on World War II in the final class of the 13- and 14-year-olds, and then again for the 18- and 19-year-olds. Understanding history for Italian schoolchildren means understanding the causes of the Third Reich's rise, recognizing the analogies between German and Italian fascism, and even commenting on excerpts from Mein Kampf. Later on, the older generation of students focus less on chronological events and more on connecting social and political trends. 
All of this is ultimately done to paint fascism in the worst light possible, to hopefully prevent it from ever taking hold of the country again. How the Taiwanese people view World War II depends on where they were educated and when. Technically, Taiwan was part of Japan during the conflict. But after the Chinese Nationalist Party took over the show following the war, they started teaching that it was Japan that bombed Taiwan during the war, not the United States. The reason? Well, people in Taiwan are taught that World War II was a glorious war of resistance against Japanese aggression. Just don't point out that many Taiwanese fought for the Japanese Empire, both voluntarily and via coercion. Canada is a little bit sore about their World War II legacy, particularly towards the United States. See, Canada's soldiers were already fighting before the U.S. ever got involved. And this scrappy group of underdogs wants their acknowledgement. Nay, their recognition. The fact is, Canada won some of the toughest battles of the war, like the Battle of the Atlantic. As for America, the country had been following a rigid policy of isolationism, until the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 basically made that impossible, causing those Johnny-come-latelys to enter the fight a few years after it had started. And there's some sour grapes there. Sure, American soldiers at Omaha Beach on D-Day are celebrated throughout pop culture, but Omaha was just one of five important beachheads to storm. And Juneau Beach was wrestled from the Germans by the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division. 350 brave Canadians died that day, and over 5,000 more during the Normandy campaign. But you don't see Tom Hanks starring in a movie about that. Maybe he can't do a Canadian accent. Norway did not have a great time during World War II. Well, nobody did, but especially Norway. After being occupied by Germany pretty early on, the Norwegian government fled to London, leaving everyone else to just kind of deal with it. Norway was eventually liberated after a German withdrawal, which left a large part of the country destroyed in their wake. The way Norway tells the story, there are many heroes like the Milor resistance cell, which had formed toward the end of the war. The English are also lauded as saviors. The United States, on the other hand, is not so well regarded. Japanese schools tend to provide two history classes, one of world history and one of Japanese history. And Japanese history includes their relationships with East Asian and European countries, including situations that led to World War II. Japan tends to frame their wartime positions as victims more than anything else. Classes spend a week discussing Hiroshima and the days the bombs were dropped. Kamikaze warfare is also discussed by Japanese youngsters, viewing many of these pilots as forced volunteers who died crashing over enemy lines. Prefectures like Okinawa were greatly impacted by World War II, and many remnants from the time can be observed on somber school trips. However, Japan also accepts its role as one of the Axis powers in the war. The country's strong imperialism forced many who fell under its rule to change their names and learn Japanese culture. And when gruesome events like the Nanjing Massacre or Unit 731 are brought up, it's typically apologetic or reflective. Russian Redditors concede that Russian school kids are taught World War II from the rise of the Third Reich to Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. Soviet-German relationships are discussed with an emphasis on the Soviet side of things. The West and their relationship with the Reich is also studied, along with some focus on the Western Front after D-Day. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, promising non-aggression between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, is framed as a necessary evil, while the bombings of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Dresden are framed as unnecessary evils. One can run into different versions of history based on who is teaching the class. Pro-Soviet teachers may have a bias towards the USSR side of things. And it's pretty much agreed that the Soviets eventually marched toward Berlin and defeated the evil Germans. Then, like action heroes, they proceeded to kick Japan's butt in Manchuria, ending the war once and for all. Russia saves the world. The end. Happy graduation. So what do you think? Has your view of World War II been affected by your schooling? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.